Welcome back everybody. This is Joan Sandwiches here to take another bite out of Zombie Exodus Safe Haven. I believe the last time I had gone to the lake and then I just got back to camp. I'm pretty sure. Oh good, and I think it actually remembered that I did that this time. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so. You check the time. 8.15 p.m. From the hillside, you see Jamie and Rachel returning to camp. They look tired and dejected. When you glance over to Jamie, he looks back to you and shakes his head, a clear sign he made no progress fixing the van. Well, that sucks. Hmm, what should we do? Reinforcing the camp might be a good idea, although I think I'm not in very good shape either. I don't know. Oh, yeah, look at that. I got hurt. <laughs> But everything else is looking pretty decent, so not too bad. Um, let's see. Oh, look, you can heal other people. That's cool. Hmm. I think, ooh, scouting the area would be fun, too. I'll take some painkillers really quick, just so I can be... A little bit better. Um, and we should reinforce our camp. I think that would be a good idea, so I'll ask her. You walk over to Gina, who brightens up as you draw near. Hi, Derek. What's up? Since we might be here for at least a night or two, we need to reinforce our campsite to keep out the infected, intruders, and wild animals. Will you take the lead and help out? A smile broadens over Gina's face. I'd be happy to help. Where should I get started? Hmm, what should we do, guys? Digging a trench would help against zombies, that's for sure. Smokeless fire pit, set up a perimeter alarm system. That might be good. A sky nest? That's cool. Damn, if I had known, I would have gathered more shit. <laughs> Spiked barricade would be nice, too, but I don't have the stuff for that. Ooh, surrounding the campsite with barbed wire sounds like a good plan. Let's do that. <laughs> that way nobody can, like, sneak in, at least not very easily. Gina bites the side of her lip. Not sure if it'll deter more than the small animals, but it might wrap up an infected. If we have the materials, it's worth it. If rodents sneak over to our food supply, they could cause havoc. I'll jump on it. Gina heads off to start working, and you know that in time the reinforcements will be finished. Cool. You check the time, 8.30 p.m. From the west side of the clearing, Kelly bursts into camp, out of breath, barefoot, and disheveled, shirt torn on the right sleeve. She collapses to her knees and drops a bloody knife to the dirt. Crying, she places her head on the ground. Kelly, are you okay? Jamie says and rushes to her side. Rachel draws her submachine gun and rushes to the western edge of the camp as the rest of the survivors form a circle around Kelly. It was awful, she stammers through crying breaths. Coyotes, they killed Nathan. Dead? Riley says, bewildered. Coyotes? What the hell? Everyone back up and let the girl breathe, Nora says, and the group takes a step away. Get her some water, Brody. Now, Kelly, are you hurt? Kelly leans up, now kneeling. No, I got away. One tried to get me, but I fought it off. Brody returns with a cup, and Kelly takes it and sips. Thank you. How did it happen, you ask? Kelly takes another sip from the cup. She holds the water in her mouth and swallows hard. We took a path west and walked for several miles. There wasn't much out there but forest and a stream. We followed a small path leading southwest with a sign for a gas station, but there were animal tracks, so we decided against taking it. We didn't make it far before we heard howls from nearby. Nathan wanted us to keep going along the trail, but I wanted to turn back. Maybe if I'd have convinced him... She sobs, body shaking, and lowers her head. Jamie places his palm on her back. It wasn't your fault, Kelly. She nods, tears stopping, but bottom lip trembling. She takes a tissue from Parker and wipes her nose. We heard more howls and spotted them moving through the woods. It must have been six or seven of them. Oh my god. <laughs> like the size, the size of small pit bulls. They were mangy and thin, and one looked like it had a festering claw mark on its shoulder. 
They were growling and making these excited barks. Nathan told me to run, but I just... I froze. And then they came. The first one attacked Nathan, but he'd been carrying a shovel and hit it on the head. It went down, but then the others attacked. One jumped and bit his face. Oh! <laughs> Another bit his arm and dragged him down. Nathan shouted for me to run again, and one of the coyotes started after me. As I turned to run, Nathan fell flat, and three of them were tearing him apart. He didn't even scream. God! <laughs> That's a terrible way to die. <laughs> Kelly's hands tremble as she lifts the cup of water to her lips. I ran along the trail and heard the coyote barking and growling from behind, his feet trampling the ground. I knew I couldn't outrun him, so I cut through the forest and ran for the small stream. I remembered seeing all the slick rocks in the water, so I made my way there, kicked off my shoes, and jumped up on the highest rock. I drew my knife and turned just as he caught up. He leapt high but slipped on the stones and caught my shirt. I slipped and cut my foot but slammed my knife into his stomach. He whined and tore off part of my shirt. He was hurt. Blood was coming from his belly wound, but he didn't leave. He howled and circled the rock. He was keeping me there for the others. I knew I only had one chance, so I jumped off the rock and went right for him. Even he was surprised. He tried to run and fight, but when he twisted around, he yelped in pain. I guess the wound in his stomach made it hard for him to run. I dove forward and slashed, slicing his eye. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> he started bucking like a bull and snapping wildly, but he finally bolted into the woods. I took the chance to run and made it all the way back here. Kelly breaks down again, shuddering and crying. That's horrible. As much as I don't like Kelly, she didn't deserve that. <laughs> Jeez. We gotta do something about this. We gotta go find those suckers and kill them, Riley says. Riley, it's like nighttime. <laughs> Rachel's mouth makes a thin line, though the edges twitch before she speaks. I can't believe this happened. And we have to protect our freaking camp, Madison says. If we're going to be here for a few days, all kinds of wild animals could find us. Church raises his hand. I'd like to go out and retrieve the body. If anyone else wants to volunteer, I'd appreciate the help. Why are we doing that? Gina asks, her voice high to show shock. The body will be ripped to shreds by now. I admit that I'm freaking out about how unsafe we are right now, but I still think we need to go out there for Nathan, Parker says. Not only is it the Christian thing to do, but if I was out there, I'd want people to bury me. We have zombies, bandits, and now wild animals to worry about? Madison asks. What next? Vampires? Aliens? Nathan deserves a proper burial, Church shouts. It's wrong to leave him there to be feasted upon by animals. I'll go myself if you cowards won't. Okay, settle down. No need for name-calling, Jamie says. Seriously, you guys. God, that's a terrible idea. As the group decides what to do, you notice the debate has two sides. On one side is Rachel, Brody, Church, Kelly, Lopez, Parker, and Jamie, who believe the body should be recovered. On the other side is Gina, Madison, and Riley. You guys, they probably ate him. Three coyotes? Like, oh my god. <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> what to do? Let's see. Yeah, being separated now is dangerous. Uh, you know what? No, I'm not letting them. I don't care if they get pissed off at me. <laughs> like, I don't want anybody else to die. <sighs> oh, wow, that last one is me. <laughs> I'm gonna have to replay this and be like a total asshole. That'd be funny. The group looks stunned by your decision. Those who agree with you seem happy, while the rest are outraged at the callousness of forbidding the mission. Soon after your decision, the group separates, and the survivors go about their evening. Despite your decision, Church, Parker, Brody, and Kelly leave camp together, <gasps> and news spreads that they defied your rule. When you see that Rachel remained in camp, you walk over to her. Ooh! Ooh, they are not getting away with that. Wow. Uh, looks like the others win anyway. Rachel looks back, her expression torn between anger and sadness. As leader, you made a decision, and whether or not I agree, I'll follow it. These are exceptional times, and some orders can be challenged but shouldn't be disobeyed. It's possible we might have to deter future disobedience. That's up to you. Oh no, hell yeah, they're, they're not getting away with that, because if they all fucking die from coyotes, it's not my fault. 
I told them to stay. Um, okay, well, fine. Now what? <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'll leave too. Let's go scout the area. Why not? Uh, yeah, I'll just keep my same weapons or whatever. I don't care. <laughs> I just want to go. And I'll keep my clothes on. You leave camp along the north-south natural path, first heading in a northwest direction towards the lake. This section of forest is thick and green with trees packed together, branches intertwining as they fight for space to bear their leaves to the sun. Mosses and molds of green and blue coat the trunks and forest floor, and insects fly and slither and creep. The mild smell of spruce, often a sweet musk, interchanges with the odor of animal urine. If you didn't know this was Colorado, you'd think it's some alien territory on a distant planet mimicking the earth. Finally, you reach a three-way divide shaped like a pitchfork. Choosing the far western trail, you follow it to a high bank with a steep drop off the end, and you stand and look over the valley. The lake is shaped like an irregular circle with small arms shooting into the countryside. On the far side, several miles away, several houses and larger commercial structures pop up at irregular distances. It would take hours to find a way around the river, unless you found a boat to go by water. It might not be worth the effort until your vehicles are fixed, as crossing the river is no easy feat. Besides, the homes are likely overrun by the infected. Backtracking on the trail, you cut to the east away from the lake. The forest thins, though the path ends, forcing you to slow down. Eventually, you come to the highway, and a chance to see what lies beyond the accident site where your caravan is stalled. The asphalt rolls on for a mile north and winds out of sight. A burnt-out car blocks one lane close to where you walk down a short hill. A news van sits along the shoulder of the highway, ten yards back towards their campsite. The Blue 7 News logo adorns the white van. A large antenna protrudes from the top, along with a satellite dish. With nothing else around, you... Um, yeah, let's check the van. Why not? Have a little danger... You walk over to the van and reach for the back door to swing it open. As your hand touches the handle, you see the door is actually ajar. You hear a sudden growl from inside, causing you to recoil. The growling sinks in, and your hand shakes as it reaches for the handle again. You yank the door open and prepare to attack. No one leaps out, and you stare into the back of an empty vehicle. Playing from a small TV monitor, a video shows the face of a zombie. The growl echoes out of the monitor, the same noise you heard before. You step inside. The news van has numerous monitors, including the one you saw on loop, along with an array of electronic devices, sound and video gear, and several computers. Splashes of blood on the console and floor have dried. The, satin, er, the stain near the side door is congealed like a sheet of plaster, and a photo is lying face down, matted to it. You try to peel the photo off the floor, but the blood holds it. The area is so cramped you can barely see into the small front compartment. The video stream restarts, showing the images flashing on the screen, and the sound of the zombie roars again. With the monitor still running, you can't help but wonder how long the power can run. Hmm, this must not have happened very long ago. Search for the power. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You're not sure how long the van has been abandoned, but it should have run out of power after a few hours. There must be multiple batteries or a generator. You inspect the monitor and find numerous wires leading from the back. It takes a few minutes to figure out which one is the power cord. And you follow this red wire down the monitor, under the console, through a series of equipment-filled bins, and around a broken shoulder-mounted camera, into a rectangular box which you deduce as a dedicated battery. Sweet. So... Do I get to take the battery? I guess I took it. <laughs> um, let's scavenge. As you start to look through all the, the equipment, electronics, and mechanical devices, a picture forms in your mind of newscasters on long trips filming for long periods of time with every conceivable doohickey and thingamabob they can pack into a van. Those are like things Woody would have said. Oh, I'm sad. You won't be able to take it all with you, and a lot of it is in disrepair. You separate out what's useful from the junk until later, when you'll decide what to take. A flashlight, a multi-tool, batteries, electric parts, mechanical parts, metal parts. Nice! 
This van must have a large fuel tank, and chances are there's some gasoline left. In a crate, there's some old rubber tubing. You can use it to siphon out the remaining gasoline into an empty plastic container. Hey, you, a voice says from the console. Um, <laughs> you glance around the back of the van. Nothing is moving in the area. Hey, I'm talking to you. On the monitor, a zombified man is staring at you. <laughs> hey, my name's Earl. He's wearing a seven news cap and leans back in a chair you recognize inside this van. He lifts a slender, grayish-white bone and picks his teeth with it. What are you doing? Uh, I'm searching the van supp- No, moron, I can see that. I mean, what are you doing with that? You glance down at your M9 pistol pointed up at your face. Whoa, what the fuck? <laughs> when you look up at Earl on the monitor, he leaps forward, cracking the screen from the other side. You stumble backwards, slamming into the wall of the van. Everything closes in around you. You wheeze in long breaths and feel faint. You burst from the back of the van and run to the shoulder of the road, hands on top of your chest. You fill your lungs with sweet air, crouch over, and squeeze your lips shut until the dizziness stops and the feeling of nausea passes. God! <laughs> you won't go back in the van to search any more of it. You only go back in to grab a few things and go. You have the following items. <laughs> Holy fuck. That was scary. I guess that's what happens when you have delusions <laughs> for your character. Um, okay, well, it was talking about mechanical and metal parts for traps and stuff, so I guess I should take those for sure. Ooh, the portable generator will be nice, too. So I'll make sure I take that. Yes, please. Five more items. Uh, let's see. How many flashlights do I have? Uh, four? That's a lot. Although I suppose more is good, but I don't know. Um, how many batteries do I have? Uh, five packs. Sure. Batteries. Take electrical parts too. I don't know what I can use them for, but they'll probably come in handy. Uh, gasoline. Yes. How many more? Two more items? Hmm. Heavy battery. Does that mean like a like a car battery type of battery? Maybe. <laughs> can take one more item. I'm gonna need multi tools. <laughs> um looks like none. <laughs> okay. You leave the van, turning your sights to the two paths to take. Should we go back or no, we'll continue. <laughs> You climb the rise to the other side of the forest, where oaks and pines dominate in hues of green. The natural path picks up again, curling south. Along the way, you scan your path and identify a number of edible offerings of the forest. You come upon short stalks of light green, almost yellow weeds. You pick one from the dirt and break the stem, and a thin, water-like fluid seeps out. From this, you identify it as pearl... Purslane? I guess, Purslane. A leafy vegetable similar to spinach. Nice. You put a leaf in your mouth and taste the sour and salty flavor. Purslane has a high content of vitamins and minerals, especially calcium and omega-3 fatty acids. Circling a tree, you find a whole plot of naturally growing purslane, and you spend a short while picking bunches. In time, you have several bags filled with them. You walk for another 30 yards and come upon a break in the woods something of a clearing similar to the one your group is using for its campsite. A low growl calls out, and you reach for your M9 pistol. Tied to a tree, a zombie hangs against the trunk, bound by barbed wire. The small prongs dig through her shins, stomach, chest, and upper arms, with her tainted blood seeping from each cut and flowing into her sundress, giving it a tie-dyed pattern. <laughs> She struggles against her restraints, teeth gnashing, air and arms and legs struggling for freedom, causing the wires to cut deeper. 
Confident the infected won't be able to escape her ties, you look through the rest of the campsite. A small picnic-style table sits on the eastern end. On top of it lies trash and a thin tree branch. A plastic shopping bag is balled under the table. Next in line is a sizable tent, enough to sleep two adults. Outside on the ground is a single designer boot. It's still covered in blood. Numerous rifle casings lie about. Stepping inside the tent, you see the area is in disarray with items chipped over or thrown on the ground. A spray of blood marks the underside of the tent roof. Ugh. Heavy blood prints show through the space made by numerous people. Drag lines lead outside. A quick, a quick search shows two large sleeping bags, a thick blanket, some cookware, and a coil of rope. In a small footlocker, you find a pair of glasses, a pack of batteries, and a roll of duct tape. Tucked under a pile of soiled clothes is a cigarette box with five cigarettes and a bottle of sunscreen. To the left of the tent is a burnt-out fire. In the embers lies a hatchet, blackened by smoke and ash, but usable. Searching behind the tent, you spot a roll of toilet paper sitting on the stump of a cut tree. Beside the stump is a notebook. Hmm. 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 Let's read the notebook. <laughs> You lift the notebook and flip open the cover to the first handwritten page. The inside cover reads, Trisha Cock, Cock, Koch, God, I don't know. I'm going to say Koch. <laughs> Friday, May 11th, 2012. First off, I really hate my bridesmaid dress, but Jenna is my oldest and dearest. If she wants me in yellow, it's the least I can do. After my scare last year, Jenna was so supportive and there for me. She really proved her friendship. She even walked to raise money for breast cancer awareness. A true friend deserves my time, even if it is to leave beautiful Miami and go to Colorado Springs. <laughs> Between Jenna and my journaling, I stayed sane. Oh god, she came here for a wedding and then the apocalypse happened. That sucks. <laughs> At least the hotel sounds amazing. The Saints Manor. It's modern and palladial and five-star. The head chef of the hotel's main restaurant was a contestant on Top Chef. Once we get to the hotel, we have complimentary couples massages set up, and even Evan is looking forward to that. I wasn't sure he'd make it. His promotion means he has to work long hours, but at least I can quit my job. Teaching was okay, but I can't see doing that for the rest of my life. This taxi took forever to get us where we had to go, but it gave me time to write. I need to jot my thoughts down. Evan is fine on his iPhone all day, playing one of those stupid games with falling blocks or something. Tetris? <laughs> Staring at a phone for hours doesn't appeal to me. We're pulling into the driveway of the hotel. There's some kind of commotion ahead. I hope it doesn't delay our check-in. Right when the apocalypse happens, poor girl. Saturday, May 12th, 2012. I'm finally sitting down for a few minutes to write. So many thoughts are going through my head. I'm exhausted, hungry, stressed, and scared. I feel like I'm living in a disaster movie, but I know this is for real. Evan has been my saving grace. It's like he knew what to do, but it's not like he was trained for it. He's an accountant, for God's sake. After the attacks at the front of the hotel, we made our way into a room and barred the door shut. I love mini bars, but I never thought we'd have to live off of one. We stayed there until this morning, and at first light, we left with only our clothes and some things Evan scrounged from supply closets and other open rooms. Leaving was a nightmare. Evan had to kill the diseased people just to get us outside. He had no choice. Part of me feels so deeply sad about anyone dying, but the virus is making them turn mindless. Jenna didn't even realize it was me. <gasps> oh no! <laughs> no matter how much I begged her to stop, she kept trying to bite me. It was the worst moment of my life. Watching Evan ram a knife through her head, I can't even think about it again. A part of me died. We stole a car and spread out of town. We didn't get far. The National Guard has closed highway travel. I don't even know where we're headed anyway. The news says the virus is spreading all over. New York, LA, Philly, and even Miami has fallen. I can't reach my family. Evan says we need to get away from everyone. Maybe even go to the mountains. I'm not made for this, but Evan has the strength for both of us. We made it as far as the military blockade allowed and ditched our car to go by foot. Evan had to do things, things he would never do days ago. We saw a family with a camper parked on the side of a road. 
The mother and father were so busy arguing, they didn't see Evan until it was too late. If the man had just listened and didn't fight back, what's done is done now. I guess leaving them with some food and water for the kids was still humane for him. Or was still humane of him. I feel like we will lose all humanity soon enough. God. We hiked for hours and hours. Evan said we're far enough away to make a camp and rest. We're beat. Sunday, May 13th, 2012. Last night, things seemed to go our way. We slept for a few solid hours each. Being out this far is safe for now. We've come across few people, diseased or living. We saw a few campers nearby, an old man and a younger man, maybe a father and son. The old one had a nice smile. He reminds me of Santa Claus, though his beard is gray. I want to meet them, but Evan doesn't want to go near them. This morning, a few people came by our camp. Even though Evan told them to leave, he's super on edge. They gave us food and blankets and a flashlight. All of them had guns and said they were forming a militia to defend against the diseased. Some were on leave from the Marines, and they had already taken over a FEMA camp. Keith was nice, quiet, but seemed to be in charge. Natalie talked mostly to Evan, like she was keeping him busy or kind of had a crush on him. What a bitch. <laughs> the third one had a weird name, like Denton or something. He didn't talk at all and just stared at me with pervy eyes. I don't want to know what he's thinking. I realize Evan is tired and paranoid, but I had to hold him back at one point from fighting those guys. At first it was all casual and friendly between all of us, but then Keith told us we should join their militia. Evan told him no, and tempers flared. I got in between them, or I got in between them all and managed to stop it from escalating. They said they'll be back to check on us. Evan wants us to leave our camp. I begged him for us to stay. He listened to me, but I hope it's not a mistake. I realize it's dangerous to be here, but where is it any safer? Uh, girl, girl, that does not sound good to me. Okay, let me take your tent. <laughs> and also, let me take your other stuff, because you're dead and Evan is not here. <laughs> So, blah, 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 I can take ten more items. How many blankets? Sorry if this part is boring, you guys, but, you know, you know how it is. Honestly, to me, this part's kind of fun to do. I have no cookware. Well, so let's take it. Because I kind of, I don't know, part of the fun of this game is managing your inventory and trying to make sure you have good supplies and stuff, if you know what I mean. Toilet paper. Oh, we're gonna take, like, I would hate to run out of toilet paper in the apocalypse. That would suck. You'd probably have to have, like, a designated cloth for <laughs> wiping yourself or something. Ugh. Yuck. Sunscreen sounds useful. And we don't have any, so let's take it. Oh, sorry, so, oh, wooden parts and duct tape were mentioned for, um, crafting stuff to protect us, so. Yeah, I'll take both of them. Uh, wood parts. And I took their one tent. Do I... Should I take the other one? Hmm. Because it, like, said I took it, but then it's on this list. So, I don't know how many. I have five more. Do I have a hatchet of some kind? I do have a hatchet. Okay. Let me take the other... Ooh, or rope, because we did use some rope to get us up the hill. We might not have any more. Uh, oh, no, we do have some. Cool. Let me take the wood parts then. And ooh, a plastic tarp might be useful too. There's so many useful things, but I want the tent. Maybe I can have both. Oh hell yeah. Give me this. <laughs> okay. Cool. And we're not gonna kill the zombie because she's like no. <laughs> You continue south through a wide natural trail where the tracks of heavy animals have roamed. 
The sounds of nature return with the whistles and warbles of birds and the chatter of insects. Once the melody has captured your attention, a rumble of jet engines floods the sky, passing from west to east. You catch only twin passing trailers of exhaust before the noise dies out. You glance over and spot a bush with bright red berries. Your botany book identifies them as currants, or more commonly, gooseberries. Looking further, you spot berries of different shapes and sizes in the grove, some with dried flowers sticking out of each one and others with small, sticky hairs all over them. As you pick each, you taste them. Tangy red berries with spines, tiny red spineless berries, pink translucent berries, juicy speckled red and tan berries, and even dark purple sour berries. You gather three pints and some of the edible stems and flowers before heading off. You pick up the pace on the last leg of the trek back to camp. I don't think I should have been eating all those berries. Okay, uh, this looks like a checkpoint. I feel like every time it's like, you check the time, and the time changes, it's like a checkpoint, and the game will remember what I did. So I'm gonna stop here. Because that was interesting, seeing the news thing, and how it was abandoned, but still powered on, which means that probably didn't happen that long ago. And reading about people going to that other person's camp with guns, kind of threatening them. A little scary. So, yeah, anyway, you guys, that's it for now. Sorry, it's been like two weeks since I uploaded it. I know life is a little bit crazy because of work and other things. But I'll finish it eventually. <laughs> Alright, anyway, you guys, thank you once again for sticking with me. <gasps> it's the phone. The dreaded phone is ringing again. I, I don't care. I'm not going to cut the phone out. I'm just going to talk through the phone. So, yeah. Thank you guys once again for sticking with me, and I will see you all later. Bye!